This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas 75771, or calling 903 963 8626. You are welcome to make additional cassettes of this message for free distribution to friends. However, for all other forms of reproduction or electronic transmission, existing copyright laws apply. Hallelujah. There's been joy in this house tonight. The joy of the Lord is our strength, and we thank Him for it. First Chronicles 26, verse 27. Verse 27, one verse. My message tonight, the spoils of spiritual warfare. The spoils of spiritual warfare. Out of the spoils won in battles did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord. One of the most profound verses in the Bible. Out of the spoils won in battles. Now, the spoil, not just battles, but won. Battles that were won. Out of the spoils won in battles did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord. Now, Father... I ask you to come and open this word to us. Lord, I see it, but I'm going to have to have Holy Ghost anointing. I'm going to have to have the Holy Ghost come and just open our eyes and our ears to understand it. God, help me. I need you. I acknowledge you. Lord, we thank you. Your word is precious to us. But Holy Spirit, we have to have ears to hear. Oh, God, make it clear. Help us to understand the spoils. The spiritual warfare. In Jesus' name, amen. This single verse opens up a profound truth, incredible truth, and I trust that you'll see it with me tonight. Once you understand this truth, you'll understand why God allows us to go through conflict after conflict as long as we live until Jesus comes or until you die. You're going to have spiritual warfare, you're going to have battles, you're going to have conflicts. It will never, ever end. And will... (laughs) Somebody said, oh. I didn't tell you anything new. You knew that. You're going to have spiritual warfare as long as we live. Now, the spoils represent the plunder, the goods... The loot, so to speak, in fact, it means loot won by victories through battles. Now, this begins back in Genesis. You don't have to turn there, but uh, this is the story of Abraham receiving word that Lot had been taken captive. Uh, There were nine kings that came against Sodom and Gomorrah, and they captured Lot and his family, took all their goods. They absolutely spoiled uh, the city took all of their victuals, took all of their uh, garments, all of their furnishings and wagon loads and carried them off captive. And the word came to Abraham, Abram, and with 318 trained men on his, uh, his small army, they took off after these nine kings. These nine kings uh, uh, end up in a slime pit. God led them into a slime pit, and they couldn't fight, and Abram overcame them, and the Bible says he took all. He, he, he absolutely destroyed these kings, and he turns around, and he comes back, and he's leading now a, a great army. He's bringing back Lot and his family, and all of those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, he gives back the goods to the king of Sodom who met him on his way back. And he said, I don't even want a shoelace of what you have. All your spoils are yours and your family, but I'm taking Lot. And But he kept all of the spoils, all the spoils of the nine kings. In fact, you you have this borne out in Hebrews 7, 4. Now consider how great the man Melchizedek is, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. He's talking about this war. And as he's coming back, he's got these wagon loads. He's not only won a battle. You see, God's not interested in you just winning a battle. He said, we are more than conquerors. Not just conquerors, but more than conquerors. 
We have, we can't come out of the battle the way we went in. And then all you have is a testimony. I survived. God's not interested in you surviving. He's interested in you coming out with some loot. He's interested in you coming out loaded down with wagons of spoils. And Melchizedek, he meets Melchizedek, or he, he goes to Melchizedek, and he gives 10% of all the spoils. And this is a picture of what we, I read to you in Chronicles. The spoils of the battles won maintain the house of God. This was given to Melchizedek to maintain the ministry in the house of God. It's a very, very clear picture that Abraham, Abram comes out of the battle, not just a victor, but he comes out with the spoils. And the writer of Hebrews says he gave a tenth of those spoils. That's a, a wonderful picture if you can begin to understand it. <clears throat> you, uh, get this one picture, please. Here's Satan and his armies leading all of those from Sodom and Gomorrah <clears throat> away. And the devil now is gloating because he has the one righteous man that could threaten his kingdom. The one righteous man, Lot, the Bible calls Lot, dwelling in Sodom. He carries him away, says, this is what happens to anyone who invades my territory. Picture another picture, please. Now Abram's coming back, and he has all of these. He has won the battle, and now he has the spoils, and he gives them to Melchizedek to maintain the eternal purposes of Almighty God. Uh, this is clearly illustrated in the setting of my text. You don't have to turn back there, but if you're still there in First Chronicles, if, uh, the two chapters previous. Now, get this picture, if you will, please. Now, folks, I'm laying down a principle that if you can catch, if you will allow the Holy Spirit to speak your mind, you will never again fear your spiritual battles. You will never again fear spiritual warfare. You begin to understand why God allows you to go through what some of you are going through right now. You understand why God has allowed a conflict in your life. He's allowed some kind of a battle that's come into your life. You'll understand the principle of it. He's trying to give you spoils. He's trying to give you resources to maintain the house of God, this temple of the Holy Ghost. And in this text, in the setting of the text, David has already appointed Solomon as king. He's now on the throne. And David up to this time has been collecting uh, all the building materials for the temple. In fact, such so, so great numbers of brass, uh, supplies of brass and stone and timbers and, and gold and silver and, and money of all kinds. And he prepared it. And he, in fact, it was innumerable. You couldn't even count it, the scripture says. And he is in the previous two chapters. He set up a divine order. The Levites, the, the porters and the singers and the players of instruments. And uh, he's setting up a divine order. And he, he has the plans for the temple. And Solomon's going to build that temple out of the resources that David has collected. But before David dies, and this is one of the last acts of David, it's right here. Out of the spoils won in battles did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord. David took all of his, where did David get all of this gold and silver and brass and vessels and timber? He, he got it from his warfare. Every battle he would bring the spoils back to Jerusalem and to Judah. And he asked, he set up a treasury. This was, if you look at the context of it, there was a special treasury. This had nothing to do with the spoils to build the tabernacle. This was to maintain the tabernacle, the, the, the temple. And so he asked Joab, all the chiefs, all the captains of all the army, to bring in all the spoils that they had won in their numerous battles. And he set up a treasury and he said, now this is dedicated. This is to be used only to maintain it after it's built. It's to maintain the house out of the spoils of battles won. Some of you, the light's going on. You're beginning to see what the Holy Ghost is saying. The battles you're going through and the battles that you have won. Spoils, resources. 
to maintain the house. What is the house? We are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. You and I are the temple of God. The spoils, out of the spoils won in battles, they did dedicate, David dedicated to maintain the house of the Lord in the original Hebrew to repair the house, to strengthen it, consolidate it, consolidate what was built, to maintain it in its original splendor, to repair any decay. It, it was a, a reserve of resources to keep the building from falling into disrepair. So that there would be no disrepair, no leaking roof, no falling timbers, no broken walls or doors or windows, but maintain it in its pristine condition. All of Israel's battles were spiritual battles. They represent the spiritual warfare that you and I go through in our own lifetime. Now think of it. God made sure that every battle resulted in more than a victory. Now, if you think this thing through now, they didn't understand it at the time, but every battle they were in, they brought back these spoils. They didn't know. They had no concept of what this was about. But without even their knowing and without their knowledge, they were building up a resource that Solomon would use. Later when he's taxing, he's building those money. God's house still has money to maintain its pristine condition. One through all of those past battles. The principle is found all through God's word. In 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter. Remember the Amalekites invaded Ziklag, David's village that he'd been given uh, by the king of Gath. And uh, the, the Malachites come and invade. And they had, they had been on a tour. They, they had been rampaging. And they were driving herds of sheep and cattle and camels. And they came upon Ziklag. And they just picked up all of the families of David and his army and all, all of the spoils of David and took it off into cap- took it off marching away. David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now you talk about a spiritual warfare. Talk about going through a great conflict. David's heart's right with God. You don't have to be living in sin to have a conflict or a great battle or spiritual warfare. Not at all. David's heart was right with God. He's headed for the kingship. But he, he encouraged himself in the Lord. They were thinking of stoning him. And you, you know the story. You see, the devil was trying to destroy the promised seed. Remember that Messiah was supposed to come through the throne of David. And the devil is gloating now. He, he has taken every woman, every wife of David that could possibly bear a seed. It is attack of hell itself. This, you talk about spiritual warfare. This is the epitome of a spiritual warfare. The enemy after the seed of Christ. And folks, that's every spiritual battle. It's not the devil mad at you. He's after the seed of Christ in you and me. He's after the Jesus in us. Now, you remember that David falls upon them, overtakes and defeats the Amalekites. David recovered all. Neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil was lost. Everything. In fact, he, he recovered all, but he recovered not only all that he possessed, he recovered all that the Amalekites had gathered from all over their excursions and all of their battles. And David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drove before them, all the other cattle, and said, this is David's spoil. This is mine. Now, you have back yours and you have this portion, but all of this, 
that they have collected from all of their battles, it's mine. Now, David had a purpose. He was not selfish. He was not keeping it to himself. You see, what God takes you through in a spiritual warfare has little to do with yourself. It has to do with resources God wants to give you to help others around you. Your husband, your wife, your father, your mother, and all around you. He's given you resources to use. Because when David came back to Ziglag, immediately he began to divide them in, in groups. And he says, you take this over to this city. And you take this. In, and finally, the last one he sends to Hebron. And now, Keep in mind, Hebron is going to be the city that brings David back as king, brings him into this kingship. And you, you understand the, the principle again out of the battles won, the spoils dedicated to maintaining the house of God. Here again, God is maintaining the lineage of Christ himself, his own son. He's doing a marvelous work here. If you just... I, I see it. I want you to see it. And only the Holy Ghost can help you to see it. He is maintaining God's divine purpose. Because up to this time, they've seen David nothing as a, but a fugitive. Those who are going to anoint him king, they see him as a fugitive, lacking power, always on the run. But now he has all these spoils, he has these resources. And he gives them to all these places, places where he was he had been hiding out where he'd been hiding. And now he's sending these resources, these gifts. Oh, it's a picture of the battles that we go through. Some of them so intense. So David was at the point of losing everything, his family, everything. And he was, he was in a spot, but he trusted God. He believed God for it. What God was not testing David at this time. He knew David's response, but he wanted to put resources in David's hands that he couldn't get any other way. He couldn't go back over here and rob from the Philistines because he would be exposed. He can't go and get resources from his own people. There has to be resources, and these resources out of his battle are taken, and God uses it to maintain his eternal purpose. You see, God wants to bring you out of your battle. For example, the scripture says, uh, tribulation worketh patience. You see, those are the spoils. And patience, what comes out of patience? Does anybody know that scripture? <laughs> I'm asking God, I just forgot it. But hope and joy and peace and rest in the Holy Ghost and the love of God shed abroad in all hearts around you. Glory to Jesus. David sent of the spoil to the elders of Judah, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. Do you understand God can use the devil, the things that the devil intended to destroy you? God can turn them around and make nothing but resources for you out of them. <laughs> David was what? More than a conqueror. And to them, which were in Hebrew, in Hebron also. You get the picture. David's coming back with wagons loaded with spoil. Cattle, sheep, and goats, camels. And he's sending them out all through the land. Everybody knows that David had won a victory. And this is how God brings forth the spoils to maintain his eternal purpose. Hallelujah. There's, a, there's another picture of it in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6. Remember, Syria uh, besieged Samaria. And uh, 
The, the story, let me, let me give it to you from chapter 6, verse 29 in Second Kings. There was a great famine in Samaria. It was so bad, the Bible said that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver. A donkey's head for 80 pieces of silver. And in the city of Samaria, under, uh, under siege by the Syrians, uh, they were eating, mothers were eating their babies. In fact, the king was so chagrined when a, a mother came complaining, brought another woman to her and said, last night we ate my baby, but we agreed that we would eat hers today, and she refused. She's hitting her baby. That's how bad it was at the time, under a great siege. And there were four lepers, remember, outside the city. Now, at this time, the enemy was encamped around the city, a multitude in their tents. They were just trying to starve the city to death. And there were four lepers, recall, four lepers that said, let's get up and we're going to go. Because if we sit here, we're going to die. And if if they feed us, so be it. If they kill us, well, we're going to be dead anyhow. So they steal into the outer parts of the camp. And it's so deathly still, and they go into a tent. It's empty. And they're so hungry, they just gouge themselves. And they notice all of the, there, there was gold, the Bible says, and there were garments, and they just load themselves up because, and then they start going to other tents, and one tent after another, they went all through the camp. There wasn't a single soldier anywhere. Their, their horses were tied to their stakes, there, there, there were donkeys, and there were cows, and, and there were garments strewn everywhere because when they ran, you see, God had caused the sound. The sound of a great army, a noise of a great army coming against them. And they said, they've hired the Egyptians. They've hired the Egyptians and there's a great army. What? God has one of the greatest loudspeakers uh, and uh, tape players or whatever. It may, to, incredible thought that God created this sound and they all fled in panic. And there's, there's, there's not a soldier anywhere. And after they've gouged themselves, they got convicted after they buried their loot. They went to the port of the city and they said, it's ghost town there. Please, there's everything you need here. And the, and the king, you know, who's walking in the flesh, he said, I'll tell you what this is all about. They want us just to walk out. They, they've all hidden out there and they're waiting for us to go out so they can move into the city and take it over. What faith he had. They sent out uh, a group, and I think four horses left that had not been eaten in the city. And they came back with this report that there was there were no soldiers. Here's what the Bible said: The Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and noises of horses, even the noise of a great host. Therefore they rose and fled in the twilight, left their tents, their horses, their asses, and fled for their life. The Bible says the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. The Bible said there was fine flour, there was barley, there were garments, and there were vessels. Once again, God's eternal purposes are being fulfilled. Once again, more than conquerors. Satan tried to destroy God's purposes here on earth. And not only is there a victory, not are they more than conquerors, but there is spoil. Everything they needed to maintain the cause of God, the purposes of God on earth. Again, it's a picture of God saying to his people, to you and to me, sitting here tonight, whatever your battle is, I promised you victory. I promised that you would be not only an overcomer, not only that you would conquer your enemies, but you would come home more than a conqueror. I'm working a purpose out in you. There's a reason for what you're going through. There's a reason for it. You don't need to understand. All you need to understand is that when you come through it, you're going to be able to look back and see what you got out of it.
God sovereignly allows conflicts and battles as a way to keep things strong and pure and repaired, a safeguard against breakdowns. Conflicts are necessary to maintaining his holy temple. Just very quickly, you can follow all through the Bible. Remember Esther? We we heard about it in a recent message, a wonderful message. And and, uh, Esther puts her life on the line to countermand a a command by a a law that was put up by the king that all the Jews from India to Ethiopia, the whole kingdom, be destroyed in the month of Adar. And she lays her life on the line to save. You talk about spiritual warfare, but this was between heaven and hell. This was between God and the devil himself, an attempt to destroy God's witness on earth. The eternal, the, the, the very seed of Christ. Once again, the enemy coming in a great battle. And you, you know the story very well. Not only did God arrange the, uh, to be countermanded, the Bible says that Haman was hung on the very gallows he built for Mordecai. And then what does the Bible say? He gave Esther the house of Naaman, the richest man in the kingdom who could spend what we would consider billions of dollars today to get the Jews killed. He gave the whole house. But, folks, what, what were the spoils? There? It, was, it was not just the house of Haman, not just the physical spoils, but the Bible's Bible says very clearly that the Jews then had light and gladness and joy of heart. The spoils of the battle. There's a proof text also. You, you, you can find it. Don't turn, but in Colossians 2.15. And I think the greatest picture of what I'm trying to say is at the cross of Jesus Christ. The scripture says very clearly, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Triumphing in what? In the cross. Triumph over it. He spoiled. What it means? He plundered the devil. He took all of his power, all of his authority, everything. Took every authority from principalities and powers and gave it to his people. Jesus goes down into the grave, and out of the grave he leads a procession that's still marching on and on of redeemed saints under the blood of Jesus Christ, redeemed from the powers of hell. And the Bible said he gave gifts who daily loadeth us with benefits. What did we get out of it? Grace, mercy, peace, forgiveness, strength, power, all that we need to live an overcoming life. Jesus rose from the grave to build a new temple. The Bible says, but Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Solomon was a type of Christ when he built the temple. He built this great temple. He was a type of just as Christ has built. He built it out of the resources that had been given to him. And the house, we have been built as a house out of the resources that are in Christ Jesus. For in him the fullness of the God had bodily. The Holy Ghost has created us. He has made us the temple of the Holy Ghost in which God abides. Folks, he didn't build half a temple. This body, this temple, when it's dedicated to the Lord by faith, trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, is a completed temple. He was the capstone. I want to tell you something. Jesus is not fighting anymore. He's reigning. The battle is over as far as he's concerned. And he's built himself a church. I stand before you, and every one of the blood of Jesus Christ stands complete as a temple of the Holy Ghost. And we did that through the resources that Jesus Christ provided. But, who's going to maintain it? 
There has to be resources to maintain it. And God will not maintain this temple without our cooperation. He will not maintain it. You say it's all in Jesus. Yes, it's in Jesus. What you learn of him and the Christ likeness that comes out of you and me in our battles. Glory be to God. Do you understand that what you're going through right now is, you know, God could at any time. Why, 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 did, why didn't Jesus make it possible? As soon as you're saved, your battle's all over. That was your last battle. Confess your sins, everything. You are no more battles, no more struggles. You're in, you're in. That's it. Just enjoy Jesus till the end. Why didn't God do that? Folks. That ground of redemption, that ground of the, a, a whole world without battles, we could not possess it. We could not keep it up. We couldn't maintain it. Just as he took Israel in one step at a time, he said, and I won't give you all the land until you are increased. You have to increase in the knowledge of the Lord. You have to be increased. You have to know him better and better. You have to be prepared. You couldn't handle the ground that he would give you without the battles. He couldn't do it. I'm having enough trouble handling the little bit he's given me. But until I'm increased in him, he won't give me any more ground. He only gives us enough ground that we can handle. Conquered ground. You see, Solomon needed more than the resources to build it. He needed the resources that had been set aside by the spoils of the battles that he had won and that all of his soldiers had won. Whatever you're going through right now, God has allowed it. I can assure you God has allowed it. And for one great eternal purpose. To make you strong. Because the one thing the devil wants more than else is take the fight out of you. The fight out of all of us. Out of the battles, maintenance. If you don't have a conflict, if you don't have pressures, if you don't have trials, if you don't have warfare, decay is going to set in. We, we would get passive. We would get lazy. We would get lukewarm. And this temple would fall into absolute ruin because we have no resources. This, do you see it? If you see it, say amen. Amen. If you're going through a battle, he's trying to stop any possibility of ruin coming into your life. You know, if this temple was a literal one, if it were made of brick and stone that you could walk around it, windows and doors and roof and all that. You know, think about it. If if this, this temple was an actual physical Brick and mortar building, you could look around it and take somebody around and say, hey, you, you see that uh, roof line there that was leaking? <laughs> I remember the battle I went through, and God repaired that. And that broken window, that, that stained glass window that was smashed and broken, and boy, did God take me through. God allowed me to go through the biggest test of my life. But look at that new window. <laughs> Look at that new window. See that new roof? That used to leak real bad. One day I went through something that I thought I could never come through. I thought it was over. But I trusted God in it. And I said, God... I want to be more than a conqueror. And he brought me through and he put a new roof. What's it going to be like? 
when we get to heaven. And, and Jesus says, do you remember that battle? Do you remember that time and he's going to give you the date and the hour and he's going to remind you of all the circumstances and you thought you were going under? He said, but do you remember how I brought you out and how that test put golden faith in you and you trusted me? And he's going to tell you about another battle, another battle. He's going to say, is it worth it? Was it worth it? Oh, but wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be wonderful if God allowed us to take the devil on a tour? <laughs> and we're home free. Here we stand before him, a glorified temple. No ruin. Not a spot, not a wrinkle. Everything in divine order. And you take the devil on a tour around and say, oh, devil, remember how you tried to destroy me here. And do you remember how you laughed and your heart was full of glee because you thought you had tempted me and I lost it? What a thank you, devil! If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be here. I don't think you'll thank, but you'll tell him. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be here. It's all of those battles I went through that made me strong in the Lord. I want to tell you something. You can cop out if you want to. I'm going to close in just a few minutes. You can drop out. I'm getting letters from all over the United States and from overseas, from family members, wives, and especially from children of pastors. This past week, one really broke my heart. This this, uh, daughter of a pastor, Pentecostal pastor, who got so bitter. He'd he'd gone through a, a great... Spiritual warfare, he went through a great problem, great conflict in his life and in the church. And he just quit. He just quit. He said, I don't have to take this. I've had it for so many years, and I I don't want any more of it. And he's almost 80 now. Won't go to church. You can't talk to him about God or Jesus at all. He's bitter. He just quit. He laid down in his struggle, in his battle. And this temple is in total ruin. His temple is gone. It's just ruins. And you can, you can, in, in the struggle, you can say, I, I don't see any purpose to this. I don't see why I have to go any further in this at all. That's enough. And you can quit. You can get discouraged and say, that's it. And you can get bitter and you can get hard. That's possible. And a lot of people are spinning out. A lot of people are being shipwrecked all over the world. It's tragic. But if you can catch a glimpse of this, and with it I close, if you can just catch a glimpse of this now, he has allowed a spiritual warfare in you. And it may not even be that he's, he's, that you will see immediate explanation. You will immediately see the results of it. Until you back away and you come through into a place of victory when, when you just simply give him faith and, and you embrace then, you begin to embrace what you're going through, embrace it and say, God is with me. God wouldn't allow this unless he had a purpose. I, I, now, folks, I, I talked to somebody today. I was just trying to rehearse my message and the sister is going through a great battle. She'd been through a lot of battles and she said, you know, there's one battle in particular I went through. 
I would go through it again as hard as it was because of what it produced in me. I would go through it again because I see the results. I wouldn't be here now. Oh, folks, I look back over my life. And if, if I bring anything to you of life today, if you hear anything from my heart that tells you this is of Christ, this is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, if I have anything of an anointing at this time in my life, and I look back over all that I've been through, and folks, there were times that I wanted to quit. There were times I could have walked away. And I'll tell you what, if, if I had done that, I'd be, I, I would be pumping gas somewhere. I just, I'm, not, I, I'm not putting that down. Not at all, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying all my children would be divorced. I would, my temple would be totally ruined because I simply walked away and didn't even try to see God's purpose and what was happening. And I look back after 50 years of marriage and the times earlier on when it was so easy to quit. So easy to walk away. And there were times that I would go into my room and fall on my face and say, God, I just don't understand this. I, the more I pray and seek you, I go through these kind of things and the attack of the devil against my wife with her, her sicknesses and the pain and all of the things that were coming at me. And I say, God, I don't understand you at all. And the Holy Spirit would come and say, be still. And the Lord would say, trust me in this now. Just trust me. And when I would trust him and just rest in him and allow him to put his arms around me, folks, out of that came a sweetness. Out of that came something special that put a backbone that gave me a spiritual understanding I'd never had before. And God wants that for you. God's allowing you. To come into a place that you could have never come any other way. Will you stand, please? Now, I know in the spirit, this is all I'm going to say. Upstairs, here, and in the overflow. just want to say it quickly. I know that God put this message on my heart for a reason, because he knew you would be here. And some of you are going through the battle of your life. Now, I'm asking you... To step out of your seat before you turn to root of bitterness or allow root of bitterness or jealousy. Sometimes it's jealousy. It's envy. Whatever it may be. Say, God, get that out of my heart. And upstairs in the balcony, you can come. And in the annex, you can come down here also. I'll pray for you. And let's believe the Lord. If you're going through that struggle, you're going through that battle and say, Brother David, I'd like you to pray for me tonight. We will stand with you together and believe him for a miracle in your life tonight. There are times I wish I could be a mind reader to read the minds of those that respond to uh, calls like this. <clears throat> but I guess it's better that no man can do that. Amen. But that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He reads your heart and he reads your mind and he knows what you're going through. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful thing to know that we have a Father who cares, who understands. It could have been that just yesterday you couldn't even conceive the battle that came to you today or that you're facing now or maybe a week ago. It only takes a telephone call. It takes you, 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 you just sit there one day and look at all your bills that are piled up and, and look like there's no way out. There's some of you standing here. You almost... At the point saying, I don't see how I can get out of this. I don't see how I can make it. Well, I, I was just reading, and, and I, I'm not going to take this long, but I was reading this just before coming to church, Second Kings, 8th chapter. Remember when the prophet Elisha raised the Shunammite's son from the dead? And then he goes to her later and says, there's going to be a famine come to Israel. Now go anywhere you want, but Israel's being judged. There's going to be a famine. Jehoram's kingdom is going to be judged with a severe famine for seven years. So she, listen, she goes less than 100 miles away. Philistines weren't under that famine. And after seven years, she comes back. And what happened, her kinspeople, her kinsmen, relatives, stole her house. And everything she had, just stole it. 
When you talk about the spiritual warfare, she was in obedience, total obedience to the command of the prophet. She, she obeyed God. Now, you may be hearing you're obeying God, but now you're at the verge. This woman came home with her son, has lost everything, lost everything. I want to tell you, when you're at the point where you feel that you can't go anywhere and that you're up against the wall, there's no hope, that's when God begins to move in miracle power, absolute miracle power. This, this woman goes and says, what are we going to do? It looks like they're going to starve to death. They, they remember that Elisha said, you want me to speak to the king? Well, he's not there. So she said, maybe he'll receive us. Maybe they told him about us. So she goes to the king, and he somehow must have been in the outer court because he had called uh, Elisha's servant that had, had uh, later got leprosy, if you remember. And he, he said, will you tell me some of the miracles Elisha's been doing? Tell me about this man, Elisha. And he told him about, he said, well, there was a woman, and uh, her son died. and." He, he laid on the bed and raised him from the dead. And the servant suddenly looks over here, and there she is. She'd come to the king to, to make her plea. He's, he's telling the king this story. Do you think that's uh, just a happenstance? <laughs> he's telling the king the very story, and the king is amazed. He's, I'm sure he couldn't believe it. And suddenly... The servant turns around, Gehazi turns around and says, by the way, there she is. She had come to plead her cause to get back her property. And and he calls her and says, this is the woman and this is the boy that was raised from the dead. Here's the woman that's at the end of her rope. There's no hope. And he... King said, are you the woman? She said, yes. And the boy gives his testimony. And he calls one of his his, uh, uh, people and he says, listen, I want you to go now and I want you to see to it that this woman's house is restored to her. Now, not just overcome, but more than overcomer. Not just survival, not just coming out, but loot. Spoils. I want you to restore everything to her that that property has produced since she left. Mm-hmm. Now, if you just stop for a minute, let faith rise in your heart. And we're going to raise our hands and just shout and thank God for his faithfulness. No, not yet. Hold it. Listen. This... God will produce a miracle. God will produce a miracle. This theater wouldn't be here if God didn't do that. I couldn't see the owner for anything. I tried and tried, and one day I go over there, he's walking the hall, and I'm able to get a hold of him. God put him there, right there, sent me the time, put him at the same place. God work a miracle, put people together like a chessboard. He owns the chessboard. He can do it any way he wants. All he asks is that you believe him, that you trust him. He's the king. Let's bring our petition to him right now. Let's believe God right now. Raise your hands. Lord, just say it. Lord Jesus, I give my problems to you. All my conflicts, all my battles, you have allowed it in my life. I receive it as from your hand. The devil cannot afflict me. He cannot destroy me. I trust God. Now praise Him. Just praise Him. We give you glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving. You, Lord, are worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to God. Glory, glory to God. This is the conclusion of the message. This is the conclusion of the message.